Welcome to Fire University. This is a podcast dedicated to fire ecology and management within the Natural Resource University podcast network. My name is Dr. Marcus Lashley. I'm a wildlife biologist, an assistant professor of disturbance ecology at the University of Florida, and a lifelong hunter that's passionate about wildlife conservation and management. In this podcast, I will interview scientists and professionals, not only on the latest research in fire ecology, but also about their experiences in hopes that you as the listeners can learn why fire ecology is important and also how you can use it to meet your natural resource management goals. So let's get to the burning questions in Fire University. Hey everybody, welcome back to Fire University. Today, I'm at Tall Timbers Research Station, and I have a few guys with me that I've known for a few years between them, and they have a really broad interest in fire ecology and have a broad knowledge base from all over the world about various topics related to that. So I'm here with Morgan Varner, and uh, Morgan, do you want to tell us a little bit about your role here at Tall Timbers? Yeah. Thanks, Marcus. I'm excited to be here and talk to you today. Um, I'm Morgan Varner. I'm the director of research at Tall Timbers. Um, I'm a fire ecologist. Uh, and like you had mentioned earlier, I worked all around the, the U.S., uh, lots of work in the Pacific Northwest, California, and in the Southeast. Um, I hail from the Southeast. This is my ecological home and my where I love to do research. And my research is on uh, post-fire tree mortality, how plants survive fire from their different traits, um, and in general, how we increase prescribed fire on on fire-dependent landscapes. Cool. Appreciate that. And I also have two Kevins here. So Kevin Robertson is uh, next on the list. I'm a fire ecology research scientist here at Tall Timbers, and I went to Louisiana State University where I cut my teeth on fire ecology working in the Everglades and uh, kind of had the bug ever since then. So I'm mostly a plant ecologist by training, but being a plant ecologist in the southeast necessarily means you're a fire ecologist, or it should be that way for sure. Uh, So now I'm focused on research having to do with uh, fire-dependent plant communities and and the ecosystem as a whole. So we're interested in everything from soil to the air quality, the spatial distribution of uh, natural communities on the landscape and how they function and how fire plays a critical role in all of it. Great. So Kevin Hires also is here with us. Yeah, I appreciate y'all uh, inviting us to, to join the podcast. Uh, my name's Kevin Hires. I'm a wildland fire scientist here at Tall Timbers, but uh, spent most of my career setting the woods on fire. And uh, and my role in research is really you know to bridge uh, this this transitional uh, area between science and management, and have tried to do that most of my career. So um, here at Tall Timbers, I've really concentrated on bringing next generation fire technology modeling um, uh, to management applications, both, uh, you know, trying to understand the physics of fire behavior, but then, it, you know, applying that in a practical way to training and to planning for prescribed fire so that we can increase its safe and effective use across the country. Very cool. So you guys collectively have have uh, built, I guess, a program here, a fire ecology program at Tall Timbers. I I wanted you guys to to talk a little bit about the role of Tall Timbers in in the fire world and what you guys do toward that mission. Yeah, I can take that. Um, So Tall Timbers, uh, lots of uh, fire ecology aficionados know it as the the place where fire ecology was born um, and the home of modern prescribed fire. we're located in Tallahassee, Florida, and that's an area, we're just north of Tallahassee. Um, it's an area that is the, the term, the Red Hills of Southwest Georgia and, and, uh, and Northern Florida. It's a 300,000 acre area that uh, receives more than 100,000 acres of prescribed fire annually. So a relatively small area with lots of fire. Um, so it's a great sort of kind of a model landscape. And this landscape inspired early work linking plants animals and and fire um so and, when you said the the birth of fire ecology i think that's the way you put it yeah. what what do you mean in the birth of fire ecology uh, to well coining the term and to think about how um, plants animals and fire work together so really the fundamental underpinnings of what we now just assume fire ecology has always been here uh, but really the first 
uh, linking wildlife habitat to fire work um, was you know done here in the 1920s um, and a lot of the earliest work that really thinks about how um, I'm, I was trained as a forester and and we think about trees trying to survive in low light etc but what the work that's that's gone on here for nearly a century uh, has really focused on um, you know how plants uh, in some ways co-evolve with fire or how they duke it out with fire and survive and I think those sorts of ideas people take as sort of um, knowns. They're encyclopedic, and uh, really a lot of that work was was done here in the Red Hills and, and continues to be done here. Um, Tall Timbers is pretty unique in a lot of ways. It's a, um, as you mentioned, a research station. It's also a land conservancy, and um, it, they focus on fire adapted communities. And it's not just regional work in this in this relatively small area. It's work that's uh, that's known around the world. In Tall Timbers' earliest, um, in the late 1950s, when Tall Timbers' formal origins took place, uh, one of the early decisions was um, to focus on advocacy and um, you know, really getting the word out about uh, prescribed fire and thinking about fire and how it works with ecosystems. So the early founders really focused not only on local work um, that were solving applied issues that, that people had really strong interest in, but also in international engagement. Um, and it's interesting, you could be at a, I could be at the grocery store in Tallahassee and tell someone I work at Tall Timbers and they question, you know, what that is. Um, but if we're in Portugal or, um, or in South Africa and someone said Tall Timbers, everyone understands the, the international power of, um, of really how, this, how our organization founded and strengthened the, the roots of fire ecology. Morgan, you know, it started with uh, Herbert Stoddard and Roy and Ed Comerick. So there was this, this, this critical mass of of really just brilliant folks that were thinking about things differently. And, and so we're building on that foundation of, uh, of Stoddard and two Pomerics. Now we've got a Varner and two Kevins, uh, yeah, but Varner and two Kevins, but you know, standing on the shoulders of giants <laughs> for sure. You, you guys are strong on the Kevins. <laughs> so importantly I, in 1961, I, tall timbers, uh, hosted the first fire ecology conference, which was really a brainchild of, uh, Ed Comerick. And that was, really uh, an important step in, in, in our earning the uh, title of the birthplace of fire ecology because it was the first time that fire ecologists uh, defined themselves as such but also convened in an international way to really make it uh, an international discipline and to get that word out around the world. And Ed Comerick traveled around the world too personally. He, he was really uh, what some people call a fire evangelist, uh, encouraging fire where he saw it and in, 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 uh, helping the kind of the the poor and the isolated uh, voices out in the wilderness saying that fire was good and encouraging them and saying, you're not alone, <laughs> you know, and come, come join us and really forming that network that's, that, that was huge and, and, and giving c controlled burning or prescribed fire legitimacy. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. One of the previous episodes that we had, I, I mentioned the Stoddard pots. You guys still have Stoddard plots mm -hmm. here, right? We sure do. We're doing research on them this year. We just submitted a paper on Stoddard plots. So. Oh, wow. Still doing research. So mm -hmm. how long have those plots been established? Since 1960. The, oh, okay. the last, the, the uh, baseline burns were 1959. And so they started, set them up and started measuring them so in 1960. Since 59. Wow. So that's something, uh, if you guys are following us on social media, we'll, we'll uh, put some footage up there so you can look at those plots. But uh, you know, it's incredible the history that, you know, we're right at the heart of, of where all this began and you guys are carrying that torch to use a pun. I like to use <laughs> fire puns in this, this podcast. So we're using lots of them, you know, in, in, in many ways, you know, as the, the, the founding of tall timbers kind of came at a time where people really just beginning to understand the importance of prescribed fire and importance of fire as a, an integral part of ecosystems. You know, now it's a, it's actually a very similar time. It's a it's a time of rapid intellectual understanding because of the wildfire seasons we've had globally, whether it's Australia or California. You know, we're starting absolutely we're starting to get more and more people recognizing that we need good fire on the landscape, and that that prescribed fire application, um, even though it's it's a different landscape than what we had in the 1960s, you know, it it, it comes with a lot of questions and a lot of complexity, and and so it's an exciting time to be in the science and, and on this interface of science and management because the need is great, the recognition is growing, and if we're going to ever break out of sort of the cycle of bad fires we have in many of our landscapes and, and achieve some resilience and, 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 you know, some positive, you know, interaction and, and, and living with fire, then, then 
we have to have the best technology and science to apply to that problem. And I, I feel like the three of us are you know, very excited to, to be operating in that in, at this time in that uh, that arena because it is yeah. like the 60s or even the 20s. Mm-hmm. You know, the, it's it's an impactful time for, for fire science. Yeah, we're getting asked a lot of hard questions and uh, really being challenged to, to come up with the best ones we can we can uh, come up with and and kind of focusing our where we want to attract grant money and where we want to focus our research based on on real needs and, and their urgent needs, mm-hmm. especially with uh, questions about fire reintroduction into areas that have been fire excluded for a long time. It's it's a tricky business, and it's one that uh, people, especially in the West, are faced with and really scratching their heads about. So I think there are a couple of things that that are sort of resonating with me when you're when I'm hearing you guys talk about this. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, and that's that's part of this effort, right? We're we're taking all sorts of approaches to trying to get fire science to people and and develop that understanding. But one of the things that I think it'd be interesting to get your perspective on is this: you know, a lot of our listeners or at least I'm not sure that they necessarily think of fire ecology and management as a global issue. So how how, could you give us some perspective on that? Like fire is a global issue. I know you mentioned Australia, and of course we see on out west uh, in the news all the time, and certainly down in the south we use fire quite often. So it sounds like to me it's even broader than that. There's a... um a quote that I'm going to butcher. Um, That's okay. That, uh, that Bud Heinzelman. Uh, we're, we're not editing it out. Okay. Really. <laughs> <laughs> There's a quote. Uh, Bud Heinzelman, who was uh, one of the you know early fire ecologists, you know mid mid uh, 20th century, he did his his foundational work on the boundary waters of uh, northern Minnesota. And the quote goes something like, "The challenge is not um, where fire was or where fire wasn't." It was, and I'm, I am butchering it, but it basically he, his view was we ought to look at we ought to look at a, at all terrestrial landscapes and figure out how fire could have been because it likely was, and you know he was going through the boundary waters, an area that uh, you know people at that time anyway were assuming there was never really fire, um, and that it was an infrequent um, disturbance, and finding histories of really really frequent fire through through fire scars on tree rings. The same thing happens in, you know, these discoveries, and I'm doing that in air quotes, of uh, really frequent fire in in New England, uh, northern Vermont, uh, places that people really think are, you know, they've termed asbestos forests. Um, We know that from different different methods to look at at, uh, fire history reconstruction that we find it almost everywhere, whether it was ignited by lightning, whether humans were igniting it. um, We know there's a really close association. Um, There always always is between humans and fire. Um, and so wherever humans were, fire has been. Mm-hmm. That's really cool perspective on it. Plants are, are more widely distributed than uh, you, know, you might expect to, at least the, the, the specific genera of plants. And so it's surprising how similar ecosystems can be on the other side of the planet. You know, how much uh, ecosystems in the southeastern United States and the pine savannas or woodlands or whatever you want to call them, basically grasslands with trees in them, function very similarly. And Southern, uh, you know, Sub-Sahara Africa and places in Australia and Asia, South America. And, uh, for, you know, for a while I kind of resisted getting in all that literature just because there's so much of it and there's a lot to read about the United States. But as I've gotten into it, I, I'm really always surprised at how similar it is. Like, well, this could be, you know, South, Northern yeah. Florida or Southeastern Georgia when I'm reading about uh, something that's going on in Kruger National Park or or in, um, you know, the outback in Australia sure. or you know, different places. So basically fire is sort of a unifying factor it sounds like on these landscapes and i think we could probably get into this in the episode where you know there are traits associated with these plants that are promoted by fire or that promote fire or both uh so we can talk about that but before we move on to this this from this topic of fire as a global issue i think that was a pretty good elevator version of you know talking about that and getting that in people's head but uh, you know, let's get back to that communication aspect, like while we're all here, you know, what, what are you guys, you guys have been working on this from several aspects. How are you uh, trying to, to get fire science in people's face 
you know, how, how are y'all going about that? I think that, that we're trying to use every potential medium possible and each of us kind of excels or, or not at, at, you know, various, uh, media options. But, uh, you know, we've been given international webinars. I had a, an opportunity to present the prescribed fire science consortium, uh, a co-production approach to apply and develop and apply and prescribe fire science to an Australian audience, uh, their center for prescribed fire excellence. Um, you know, Kevin has traveled in the world, uh, China, um, you know, Morgan is, uh, is, you know, been all over North America. I mean, I think that, that really leverage in every opportunity to, to talk to, to not just scientists, but the public, try to get an understanding of how they're using fire. My colleague, Joe O'Brien, uh, specializes in, in tropical fire ecology and, you know, every island that uh that i'm fortunate enough to be drug over to and, and help him burn you know has has what i would call feral fire the way that that the people are setting fire for their objectives whether it's agricultural cultural or uh or, or ecological you know isn't the way we do it and it probably characterizes the vast majority of fire that's set globally and so just getting the word out um not you know not not diminishing that as a as an approach but really embracing what it can do and and how it uh, applies, but the message globally has to be different because the fire culture differs. Um, in fact, we could say that the same thing about every state in the United States. Um, it's just got its own kind of unique fire culture that requires different media, different approaches, um, public versus private, et cetera. Yeah, I'm a co-PI on the Southern Fire Exchange, and the whole purpose of that organization is to deliver fire science or to convert it into forms where people can absorb it and use it. So we write a lot of fact sheets and research summaries that are really designed in, in boiling down the important information that would be most useful to, to managers. Of course, we at Tall Timbers don't uh, demand honoraria for giving talks, so you'll find us at the uh, Rotary Club and the uh, <laughs> you know Plantation Wildlife Arts Festival, just wherever we're asked to come um, show up and talk. Uh, we're, we're all very involved in the prescribed fire councils, which is a really important interface of basically all people um, with any connection to fire, including private landowners and state and federal agencies and NGOs. So that's a good place for us to, to spread the word about things. Of course, we publish uh, both professional research papers, but also a lot of outreach and extension, write magazine articles. Um, I, we give lectures at universities, guest lectures. We have a stream of students coming through Tall Timbers who are not necessarily um, have any background in, in fire ecology or fire, so that's a real opportunity there. And of course, we have the prescribed fire training center, which is which is super important for bringing federal uh, fire managers from around the country and around the world uh, to Tall Timbers and to this area to get experience in prescribed burning. And at Tall Timbers is one of their stops when they come through here. They learn about uh, fire ecology, specifically a burning for intentional management and positive outcomes for ecosystem management. Yeah. And that, that's just to name a few. You know, just like Kevin said, yeah, we like uh, we take every opportunity that's... that comes up to. To get the word in the grocery store, you know, sometimes I'll have a conversation. What do you do? And I'll, I'll start my, my spiel about yeah. why fire is important and, and get it in there. <laughs> and that's that's an opportunity as well. And sometimes I'll say, oh, I, I have a, a daughter who's looking for an internship, you know, who may not know anything about it. And, and she yeah. comes over here. That's happened a few times. And they've gone on to become fire ecologists, you know, because of a conversation I have at, at a picnic. And so you, you don't want to miss any chances. We've been really fortunate too uh, to have started this fire fest to really communicate to the the local public the importance of uh, of prescribed fire and and really the importance of, of of smelling smoke in the air. It you know smoke too often can be a nuisance or a hazard on roadways and so you know being able to to sit here in the Red Hills it's the epicenter of prescribed fire globally. I mean really I mean intentional fire set. Oh yeah, I remember and, us looking at a global map with the distribution of fire and you could see it just as plain as day sticking out like a sore thumb in the we, Red Hills. We burn the equivalent of, you know, one of the uh, you know, the massive fires in California over the last 4 or 5 years, uh, you know, Thompson Road fire, that Tubbs fire, we burn that every March within a, you know, 50 mile radius of Tallahassee. And for the most part, nobody notices, you know, if there's a little bit of smoke in the air and it is a nuisance, we're not going to deny that. I mean, it's, it's part, it's part of having a sustainable relationship with fires. Yeah. Is we talked about that, that last week where some, one of the intangible things about fire, even if you don't accomplish your objective necessarily, is that if you show people that you can pull it off, that, uh, you know, you may gain community acceptance, which is pretty important. So, 
related to that, you talked about these different outlets and then how the culture is different in different places. And of course, we've had fire in the news, and that's almost always because it's a negative thing in the given context. So I was curious uh, if you guys wanted to talk a little bit about some of your efforts that, you know, to distinguish, I guess, between wildfire and prescribed fire and what you guys are, how you're working on that issue with communication, because, I mean, let's be honest, the big platforms that get the attention of the most people are normally talking about the, you know, some of these catastrophic events. So it's curious how, how that's fitting into this, this uh, conversation. One part of our message is, is just trying to help people understand fire as an ecological process instead of a destructive process. And certainly it can be a destructive process, and, and you don't want to minimize the uh, the damage of the terrible wildfires that happen under unnatural conditions of fuel accumulation and probably climate change and, and you know maybe mismanagement of the landscape. But it's important for people to at least understand that fire has been on the landscape uh, as long as these these communities have existed and that they actually are, are maintaining the systems instead of destroying them. So especially in these southeastern pine savanna types, or really most of the, the fire-dependent ecosystems we have in the southeast, fires don't actually kill many of the plants because so many of the plants are perennial. They just re-sprout as soon as you burn them. And so the analogy we use sometimes is, is just like mowing your grass. You, you're not killing the grass, you're just knocking it back a little closer to the ground, and they just re-sprout from the roots again. So the 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 analogy that you use with the grass in your lawn, that, that grass is well adapted to deal with that repeated exactly uh, top kill like that, and it grows back just like... I, this is one of those things that I really hate. It, it bothers me to mow my grass because I'm just... I just think about it. It's like, you know, next week it's going to be this height again. I'm going to have to mow it again. It doesn't make any sense to me. But that's kind of what you're talking about. With so you don't burn your lawn? <laughs> do what? I, you don't burn your lawn? Yes, I do burn my lawn. Uh, it's hard to you. now where I live now, but uh, I have burned my lawn before. Uh, yes, yeah, so <laughs> that's a good point. I also don't kill the fire ants just because they have fire in the name. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> now we're going a little, little off track, but my point of that was I think you you have a, a good point that you're making that's laced within that is these plant these perennial plants re, just re sprout, and that's actually an adaptation to dealing with fire, which I'm sure we'll get to here in a few minutes when we start talking about some of these traits of plants and and how that lets us know that fire is everywhere and and why that's important in these systems. But, uh, I think another aspect of that that's important is is helping people understand fire regimes, and and you know you're cutting the grass. It's it, it's a regime. It's not you don't cut your grass once and you're done for the rest of your life. Right, and and if you don't cut your grass for a while, it's really hard to come back and cut your grass. Right, <laughs> that is another perfect analogy for prescribed burning. The, yeah. the, the more you do it, the easier it is. Right, for a lot of different reasons because you don't have an, as much fuel, so the fire behavior is not going to be as extreme. It's not going to produce as much smoke. It's not going to produce uh, flame lengths that are as long, so it's easier to contain, on and on. So, yeah, we, we, it's, it's something very similar to cutting the grass. We put it off because we don't want to do it, but the longer we put it off, the, the, the worse it gets. And if we, do, if we have the discipline to do it more often or the resources to do it, then it's a lot easier to do. You know, something I, I think, you know, your question, there's a, kind of a silver lining on, you know, this year we're at the tail of you know, 4.2 million acres burned in, in California this year in wildfire, it's, you know, order of magnitude sort of change for them. And, uh, I think one consequence of it that I like is that the depth of conversation is greater. Um, you know, if, if there are half a million acres that are burning or a million acres that are burning, um, it is a bit of a nuisance and it moves on through the next news cycle. And this year has been, at least in the U S has been, you know, all eyes have been focused on California and, the number, the, the the quantity of stories is one thing, but it's also the quality where people are focusing on, you know, these forests are not destroyed. Those sorts of news stories are happening now when usually, you know, we all fire ecologists cringe when we see, uh, you know, 100,000 acres destroyed or, you know, demolished. Those sorts of, you know, imagining a, you know, a city collapsing or something from bombing. And that's not what fire does. And I think there's been a real change in the quality of conversation over it. Um you know, whether that lasts or not, but I think it's a, it's refreshing to have it when you talk to the media for them not to say, 
how, just how bad is this? And say, well, actually, this part was really good, and this part was really good, and it's caused a dialogue with society over how they deal with fire, which has always been the, the greatest challenge. It's something that makes Tallahassee somewhat unique. Um, if you're plotting in the United States where prescribed fire or where fire takes place, and then you overlay where people live, uh, there are very few places like you know a state capital like Tallahassee is a you know major interstate and U.S. highway system, uh, tourism, et cetera, that are all sitting here, surrounded on the north by the Red Hills private lands burning, and on the south by um, St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge, Apalachicola National Forest, a host of state forest lands that are all using a lot of fire. Um, and what would most people would assume uh, was back in the in the boonies, but certainly not here. It's uh, you know addressing a you know, legislators that are coming from everywhere, international visitors, et cetera. And I think that's a really neat, Tallahassee is a unique way to uh, to take the lessons learned here about how people think about fire, uh, think about smoke, and uh, and what it means for regional biodiversity conservation. One thing that's been kind of cool lately is that there's been more news coverage about indigenous people groups uh, getting back to fire because they're realizing that uh, that's a, a rich part of their land use history for, for millennia probably, you know, in, in, in North America that was taken away by government basically saying, no, you can't do that or you can't do this and that. And so it's uh, it's something that's been very newsworthy and, and it's just good all the way around, you know, seeing seeing uh, people um, give, give rebirth to uh, very important traditions as well as seeing prescribed fire getting back into places uh, where you might not have expected it, especially out in the West. Mm-hmm. And then also getting the coverage of that and, and giving them the voice uh, of, of saying what all the benefits and are, are prescribed burning, uh, not just ecologically, but but culturally and for um, just providing a landscape that's very resilient and safe against wildfire. When I uh, bought a piece of land in southern Mississippi, it was an area where there hadn't been any prescribed burning in a long time. And I got NRCS uh, funding to help to plant some longleaf pine there, which also hadn't been done by that officer ever in that region and I started burning it for the first time and uh, most of the people who lived along the edge of the the property were African Americans who are a lot of them were older than 40 or 50 years old and they started coming out and I thought oh, I wonder what they're going to think about this you know and they were, they were just delighted they were nostalgic about it I said oh wow you're burning that we hadn't seen this here in years and we used to do it at night and we used to this is the way we used to you know we would put in a backfire and we'd start about five o'clock all and, of a sudden you had a fire crew yeah like. <laughs> it was, um and yeah people came out and, and and now i know all the neighbors there who help provide water and they come and provide assistance with their prescribed burning so it's an example of um how how that uh, even just a thread of connection to the to the cultural history of prescribed burning an area is super valuable because if it had been in a part of the world where there wasn't that memory, you know, where there wasn't that tradition, then it, it might have gone differently. <laughs> you know, it might have been a lot of resistance and that kind of thing. Actually, I did get a little resistance from a guy who had a chicken farm down the road. So, you know, there's always a smoke-sensitive area around there, which <laughs> chickens qualify for that. Sure. But most of the neighbors are very supportive, and it's been great. So to p- pick up on the thread just a little bit, Marcus, um, you know, the, the growing recognition that, that prescribed fire – is going to be needed and it's going to be needed at scales many places have not seen is the easy part right and uh and 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 knowing that it has to be done is not 90 percent of the battle it's about 10 percent of the battle actually restoring fire and resilient fire regimes to these these landscapes is going to take a lot of time and the tools to do it don't exist you know in an operational setting now um you know we have we have gotten away from you know, this, this local knowledge, local acceptance, and, and to build that culture is going to require a concerted effort. Again, recognition is part of that, but then to do it and to do it safely in these kind of complex landscapes is going to take a quantum leap in the way that we plan and execute prescribed fire. And one of the things that, that, that this group here and, and all of our collaborators, I mean, we're part of a much larger consortium, uh, called the Prescribed Fire Science Consortium. It, it interfaces with other groups of scientists and managers as well. Are dedicated to doing is developing the science basis and the technology basis for the next generation of tools that are able to plan complex prescribed fire, link those to decisions that we have about things we control, like the day of burn and the ignition pattern, and then provide the science basis and the tools to model those forward so that you can communicate with the public, that you can train you know, the next generation of fire practitioners in a way that, that 
I didn't have. I, I learned by trial and error. And at a place like Eglin Air Force Base, which was large, had a long history of, you know, of, of advanced fire management, you know, to be able to do that was a privilege. Well, you know, the landscapes we're talking about are not very tolerant of the error part of the trial and error equation. And so we really need to be reimagining how we train, how we communicate, and how we plan for prescribed fire in these complex landscapes. And I feel like you know, we can unpack this a little further, but I feel like our group um, of researchers and managers that we've got, you know, in this this consortium has has really the opportunity to transform uh, our approaches to prescribe fire in those landscapes and provide the tools, the next generation tools for uh, for uh, implementation, execution of safe and effective prescribed fire. And it's, it's a really exciting time to be a part of that. I think that, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about there's the history part of um, tall timbers and prescribed fire in the U.S. and internationally. And it's it's the thing that, you know, makes the hairs on my arm stand up. But the the transition from, um, from you know, advocacy or at least the old school advocacy, you know, recognizing that, that fire is important and here's how prescribed fire is a, is a great tool. That transition to the real complexity that, that is in places like California, that's in places like um, Australia, South Africa, um, and the changing culture of the United States around prescribed fire. Those are the real challenges. How do we take um, tools that were developed in the 1960s and 1970s and either glean off the, the important parts that still exist, or how do we embrace new models? How do we in, in, embrace you know, really thinking more about prescribed fire and not um, you know, taking things that were developed for wildfire or taking you know, 1960s and 1970s ideas and applying them to this, the vast diversity of, of issues that, that, uh, that play out in our contemporary landscapes. And that's the, our transition as an organization. We have the history, um, and often we're in the room because people go, oh, tall timbers, that's awesome. Um, but really how we're playing a role in um, you know, thinking about the next generation of tools, whether it's for fire behavior, how we think about uh, the ecological effects of fire, um, how we think about fire weather, et cetera. That's the real, that's where we are right now. And I think like the Kevins both said, it's a really exciting time, probably about as exciting as that 1950s, 1960s um, to get the word out. We're beyond getting the word out. And now we're really dealing with some of the, the, the you know, the wicked problems of, uh, of fire. That's really interesting. So, uh, I mean, it sounds like to me even, I mean, it, a lot of even the the resources from a research standpoint and where we're putting that effort. You guys had a, a paper recently where you were talking about this, how we even need to change where or, or at least refocus where we're putting resources to develop, you know, some of these ideas on on how to do this, right? Yeah, I mean, our, our research investment over the last really 40 to, to 50 years now has been largely focused on wildfire. It's wildfire spread. Well, in a prescribed fire, the rate of spread is probably the least important component because you know the you know the box, uh, you know what you want to accomplish. Um, those tools that are based on uh, the Rothmel spread model uh, inherently cannot deal with heterogeneous fuels, which we deal with, can't deal with heterogeneous uh winds, which we deal with on a prescribed fire science basis or a prescribed fire implementation basis. And, and they, they, you know, they can't deal with the ignition patterns that are complex. I mean, it, it violates the assumptions of the spread model. And so we, we are working with Los Alamos National Lab, uh, U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station, um, uh, colleagues at the Rocky Mountain Research Station, and, and others to really try to build the foundation of, of this, this new approach uh, to modeling prescribed fire. In you know using three dimensional fuels, and we have lidar technology. We have the capacity to represent trees explicitly across the landscape scale. A group called Wi-Fi in Southern California is working with uh, Dr. Russ Parsons at the the Fire Lab to create a a one meter I mean, sort of cube, think Minecraft for fire, um, of all the fuels across California as part of an NSF funded project called the Wi-Fi Commons. And to be able to do that now as a foundation for accessing these next generation tools is a game changer for prescribed fire planning. Cause again, the old tool suite didn't work. It wasn't designed for this. And so focusing on that, um, in areas like new England, where 
fire, fire culture has been lost, but there is a history and, and a, a group of fire dependent species. Having fire ecology help develop the justification and the uh, the impetus for reintroducing fire before those areas experience climate change and wildfire takes hold in ways that we haven't seen over the last 100 to 200 years. And so those, uh, the, you know, this relationship to prescribed fire, the investment in the science and the tools and the technology to do it well is happening. And it's being funded by a variety of sources and being done by really a, a, a loose consortium of integrated friends and colleagues that, again, is, makes it a, an exciting and fun time to be in the discipline because we're going to define, you know, fire management and the, uh, the science basis for it for the next 50 years. And it's going to happen very quickly. But even the uh, focus on, on fire and technology and how an individual fire behaves and its effects in a particular fuel context is it, isn't where we can stop. We need to understand the ecology as well, because what happens in between the fires is going, going to be what d- uh, determines the, the fuel structure for the next fire. So there's always a feedback loop of the effects of one fire on vegetation. And how is that going to influence the, the redevelopment or growth of that vegetation to influence the next one? So I think a longer term view of this is, is, is to look at the, the cumulative or the um, uh, uh, sort of the um, synergistic effects of one fire on the next and the next and, and the fuels involved with that. So my point is just that the ecosystem and understanding it and the natural community processes are always a part of fire ecology and you can never you can never study, get very far down the ecology road without understanding the fire science, and you can't get too far down the fire science road without understanding the, the ecology of these ecosystems. So it's inherently interdisciplinary. Yeah, I think that's a good point. We, you know, even w- with us in the room, we all are active in very different ways with the, in the fire world, so to speak, right? We're all studying different things and parts of different parts of the community, and collectively, we, we're all trying to increase our use of prescribed fire and ultimately that feeds into uh you know whether or not wildfires are going to be an issue right we're we're trying to invest up front in that this knowledge and and uh, application of fire in a safe context so that we don't end up in an unsafe one so i think that's a, a really cool way to to think about this is it's really important to have all these aspects and understand them but also uh, use them synergistically to to uh, improve our our management of ecosystems and and uh, keep people safe. Yeah, you know, to play a little bit off of, um, you know, it may sound like Kevin and Kevin's stories are a little bit, you know, we clearly can't use this old technology to understand fire behavior. We know fire beha- fire behaves differently. And I always uh, spent eight years in California, and I remember looking. I would try to explain to my students. Um, why a model didn't work very well and you know i'm at the board writing equations and showing something and all i really need to do is turn on the tv and look at a plume from (laughs) a current fire that was burning in their backyard almost literally um and that the the really the sea shift from um, looking at fire as a somewhat simplistic phenomenon um, from a fire standpoint is one thing you know we're we have this this uh, explosion of technology to be able to sense and look at fire differently. Fire is a very difficult thing to study for obvious reasons, um, but we're now getting it is really hot. <laughs> we're now able to sort of get inside fire better, um, and you know the physics that fit that. I think we're now getting to a really good spot where we can join those. But from the vegetation side, and you know fundamentally, we're all um, I think we could all consider ourselves fire ecologists. Us understanding. Being able to translate that part with how fire actually behaves to how plants interact with it, how you know the our the models for understanding how trees die or survive are similarly built in the 1960s and 1970s. Fire happened, and then here's a percentage or a probability that that trees might die. And what we're as we as we know from all the last 30 years of physiological research, we start to get to how plants function too, and how plants function when when they're um, when they're surrounded by heat, and I think that part, each of the aspects, as we as you sort of um, disentangle or disarticulate um, the different aspects of fire, that stuff is really really exciting. If it was, you know, if you think about your own career, if it's you started 30 years ago and you were doing something in 30 years, when you, when you get to your retirement, you're doing the same dang thing you were doing 30 years ago. That's not very exciting. And I think we're in a really neat phase where 
30 years ago, we go, oh, and that was, that's precious that you thought that's how it worked. And what they knew, and this is the same thing that, you know, Kevin was talking about from fire managers, fire manager standpoint is they knew those models didn't work in the field and they would almost sort of laugh it off. Yeah, we did it. And every burn you've been a part of, uh, if a manager says, here's what the model predicted today, half the, half the folks that are burning go, yeah, right. You know, like we don't have that for hopping in a jet and you're you're taking off from gate C3. You don't go, we don't know how it's going to go, folks. Or we, the models we, might, this. we might land at this. Event. Yeah, we might. <laughs> exactly. Hopefully we'll <laughs> land at Hartsfield. Maybe not. We were close. We landed in Georgia. <laughs> yeah, right. So the same sort of thing could be done for fire. And I think that's that's the exciting, you know, where we are, this inflection point in, in these fields is really exciting. Um, yeah. And I think that's what keeps us, you know, coming to work every day. Yeah, really exciting. I, I know uh, on my side of things, I'm I'm looking at it from a different perspective than you guys are normally. But uh, you know, that's what's exciting to me is seeing fire drive the distribution of animals, and then that feeding back on how fire affects plants, and you know, the, the the idea that that's an intertangled web is just so interesting. You're, you're right on, Marcus. I mean, it's all about variation. You know, prescribed fire and actually any fire effects is about the variability created by the fire in its in its ecological effects, whether it be wildlife, wildlife habitat, you know, the, the plant's biodiversity. And so the new tools and, and this high, you know, high resolution opportunity to model ecosystems, not fuels, we're looking at, at vegetation and it's in all its glory, um, gives us a chance to capture heterogeneity and variability in a way that is ecologically relevant you know, through not just the plant community, but the wildlife community that depends on that habitat and its variation. So, you know, these tools uh, are really going to open up, a, I think, a, a whole new, you know, kind of wildlife ecology uh, discipline, you know, not just dependent upon the fire behavior, but then those heterogeneous vegetative responses that we can measure now with LIDAR, that we can connect to population modeling. It's, I think, I think it's going to be a really interesting revolution in, wild, in wildlife management and wildlife ecology that, that kicks off of this hyper uh, detailed, you know, fuel to veg mapping and ecosystem approach with the with next generation tools. Yeah, that was a topic of a recent paper we published on longleaf pine. How you can't have a sustainable longleaf pine savanna without areas that burn and other areas that don't burn. So where you, where you have a pine, it's going to drop the pine needles and keep it burning in that spot so you don't have regeneration. Of course, you don't need regeneration there. You've already got pine trees. Mm -hmm. And then in the gaps between them, you don't have the pine needles, and so you often have skips of fire, areas that don't burn, and that's where the longleaf pine is able to get a foothold and and um, you know be able to survive, not have fire long enough to really get established so that when fire comes back, then it's just fine and it burns out all of its competitors and so forth. It's just a one little example of the many different ways in which the heterogeneity of fires is it's not just interesting, but it's like essential for the ecosystem to function. Right. That's what I was going to say. And there was something that you said uh, before we got on the show that I wanted to bring it back before we uh, conclude for, for this episode. But, uh, you know, what you just described one part of that process and how heterogeneity is really important, even for a species like longleaf that's really a fire dependent species needs fire, right? But it's still important to have heterogeneity throughout the life cycle of that species. And then we multiply that times 10,000 species, and you can see how complex that gets really quickly. So it's pretty amazing to think that we have a tool that is so versatile that creates such a huge diversity of of a context i guess within these systems and structure and you know uh, it's really interesting to think about that from a ecosystem service standpoint and a biodiversity standpoint that you know we have this one tool that's so flexible and so complex that it also makes it really hard to to understand and we need technology to i mean the way fire does work is through energy deposition right and and that energy has an ecological effect it cascades with time since fire you know in a in a variety of feedbacks that that then you know animals respond to future plant you know the interactions uh, are responding to and and being able to understand the variation in energy release and energy deposition and ecological response allows us to model and manage things more uh, precisely um, you know, so that, that when we aim at when we aim at Hartsville, we're not just uh, Hartsville International Airport, we're not just satisfied with landing in Georgia. And and so, you know, again, the, the modeling tools are are now capable of representing the variation we know is important. And so now that drives a more focused um, 
effort in fire ecology and wildlife biology to understand the variation that's important now that we can model it. And so that's that that that's the explosion. That's that's the uh, you know the opportunity for yeah for future you know fire ecologists, wildlife biologists that are coming out right now, and and they'll have this tool suite you know available, and 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 we hope that it's just a starting point. You know, I mean, I think it it it's going to be a technological revolution, but we don't want the technology to be stagnant. You know, for another forty or fifty years, we want the we want to see models of fire behavior be done like you might. Uh, you know, model hurricanes, an ensemble approach where it's not one size fits all, but yeah, we've got this opportunity to develop a diversity of approaches that may work better in certain you know ecosystems, certain situations, but really embrace that uh, that diversity of approaches to understanding the phenomenon and then modeling it forward. Because as we move into climate change and novel ecosystems and novel uh, combinations of species, uh, you know, that are arriving from other continents and Fire excluded you know, habitats yeah. is where the modeling is really going to be important to find the road back. And that's one of the biggest challenges right now. You know, over 50 years ago, we had it easy when everything had been frequently burned. It's just a matter of keeping it going. But now that we've got, you know, 50, 100 years of duff accumulation and coarse woody debris accumulation, we, we've got to be able to model fire behavior that wasn't part of the uh, natural history of those areas in, in order to get back to... Imagine trying to mow your yard after 100 years of not mowing. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're we're uh, increasing the level of of uh, fuel consumption by whatever lawnmower you're using. <laughs> but some of the, like the the points that each of you just touched on really get at it. It's in some ways we were raised um, not to show our age or gray hairs, but we were raised to look at burned and not burned or. This was burned a lot, and this wasn't burned very much. That's how we think about landscapes. If you look at it with the GIS and you're imagining it, um, and that's kind of how we dis- discuss things, whether it was looking at wildlife habitat or looking at, at um, you know, understory plant diversity. Even with like a researcher, you would have a control plot, which is unburned versus a, a burned plot. Yeah, I've talked about this with several scientists. <laughs> yeah, good. Or you want to get us started on another one. Um, and I think that sort of, you know, there's a, there's a certain part where you, as a researcher, you want to try to minimize complexity. Like, let's just get to the central question here and let's slough off the other stuff. But really, You're trying to isolate a variable because of you know sort of data revolution, because of technology and the way we can measure stuff, we're at the we're at the time where we can embrace the complexity. And that's just to me a paradigm shift in how we think about fire ecology. It's not rah 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 fire. It is this greater appreciation for just how difficult and complex this issue is. And then it's just a lot more exciting. Right. So, yeah, and it's difficult and complex from so many angles. Like there's a sociopolitical, you know, the, an ecological complexity. There's lots, a complex set of complexities. <laughs> <laughs> Squared. Yeah. So, well, guys, I uh, really appreciate you taking some time to talk to me. You guys do a lot of great work and uh love to see all the different kinds of things i mean you'll work in completely different areas of fire ecology and that's pretty cool to, just to think about that that we can sit down and still talk about this this thing together and uh think about it from different perspectives and i think that's great to to bring to the audience and and i really appreciate you guys doing this Fire University is part of the Natural Resource University podcast network funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you like what you heard today in this episode, please follow us on all the social media platforms at UF Deer Lab.